Sorry about your life. <laughs> camera's there. Look over the camera. <laughs> We're live now. Look right there. No, this camera. We're on I that camera. I don't need to look at the camera. People want to see who you are. They want to see you. No, they want, nobody they, needs to see you. They me. want to see you. Click on it. Nobody needs to see you. Yeah, they do. Me. They do. No. Hey, everybody. How are you? It's Jeff Gelwin of Solid K9 Training. And I've got Linda next to me. And this who is. Who nobody needs to see. <laughs> that, those are your I'm words, man. Put a bag on those my those head. are your words. And uh, uh, I do this show. Uh, I, I, I do the show. Hey, everybody. Hey, 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 hey. So I do the show because so many people are struggling out there with their dogs. And um, there's so much misinformation out there. And I'm actually, boy, do I've got some, just a lot of stuff to talk about. I'll probably do that on a different Facebook, on a YouTube live or a Facebook live or a, 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 a Q&A. But anyway, my name is Jeff Gellman of Solid Canine Training. If you're brand new to my world, I've got a training facility up in Providence, Rhode Island. We specialize in aggression rehab and behavior modification. Um, we work with some pretty serious dogs, but we also work with, you know, happy-go-lucky puppies. Um, I personally travel the world. I do dog training seminars. I was actually just in Long Island. This weekend, I'm going to be up in Cowlingwood, uh, Canada. We've already got like 35 people um, there. And you know, T3, our T3 seminar, it's, yeah. so, it's sold, sold out. out. It's sold, sold out today. It's sold, out. It's sold out today. So that's really good. That's a seven day intensive. That's sold out with 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 uh, uh, a lot of people. Anyway, if I want to go to T three, do I get a discount? No, you can't go. Actually, it's sold. I can't it's, go? it's sold out. Well, I don't need to go this time. Maybe you, some other time. You can't. Hmm. So now it's time to ask your dog training questions. <clears throat> if you don't understand what I do, you're going to hear me talk a lot about punishment on this show. And I would say 10% of what we do at the training center is punishment. 90% of what we do is like positive reinforcement, but I'm not going to go talk science. But what I'm saying is most people ask questions on this show that um, we reinforce them with usually food, praise, physical touch, sometimes a toy, but we don't do a lot of toy stuff at the beginning to, to you know, to teach dogs. But but when we want to stop an unwanted to be two favorite people on YouTube, yeah. hi Jeff and Linda. No, Linda, to, I to sneak you in. So excited to participate in three T three. Okay, watched all your videos on e collar training. I cannot find my dog's working level. No response. It's snug. It works. No dis distractions. What gives? Absolutely no reaction. All right. So you want to make sure that number one that both units are on. I would test it off the dog. Put it on your hand. Make sure it works. The unit also comes with a light, a little light switch. So you can test it with a light switch. Also, what you're gonna do is, is you wanna make sure, remember your dog's gonna do anything. We live by a fire uh, in an urban area, so there's a fire station. That was a police car, but though. Um, your dog's not gonna just do something. So remember the remote collar only gives information. You still have to give leash pressure to the dog and lead the dog. So if you're above 20, you're, it's probably not on snug enough. It's possibly that it's not making contact. If you have a thick fur dog, you need thick fur contact points. That's really, really important as well. So you want to make sure it's on super snug. Start at number two, go to four, go to six, go to eight, go to 10. And this is on, a, I'm talking about on an e-cower technology or on a dog tree unit. The ones we use go to 100. And you should start seeing something. And if you're not, it's possible you have a defective unit or something is wrong. Try it again, but it's probably fit. Next. Okay. Haley, thanks for the hair compliment. It's a work in progress. Kyler, how do you punish a six-month-old puppy from whining when they don't get their way? Well, it's not about getting their way. So we don't punish a dog for not getting its way. We punish a dog when we want to stop an unwanted behavior and if they're doing something dangerous, not if they don't get their way. That's 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 important to specify. So it's important that we raise our puppies properly. But is a six month old dog though? It's it's it, you, it is a puppy, but a six month old dog for whining, you can use a lot of things for whining. You can use a bonker for whining. A bonker is a wrapped up towel. Oh, shoot, it's still packed away from my, my uh -oh. seminar. It's a wrapped up towel. I demonstrate bonkers all the time. A pet convincer, which is compressed air, a leash pop, or remote tower. But the magic to punishment is you never yell, you never scream, and you're not angry. It's matter of fact. That's why we love tools. You actually can use less force. So next. All right. This is from Jessica. When I stop to talk with neighbors on a walk, my lab will popcorn jump out of a sit and bark because I will not let him greet them. Am I underwhelming him with the prong? Would e-collar correction be better? So number one, you want to work on really good sits around distractions, number one. So your dog <laughs> needs to hold a sit 
and around distractions. And I would let nobody pet your dog right now in public. Nobody, I don't ever, I don't let anybody pet my dogs. My dog's job is to walk next to me. And if I see somebody I want to talk, talk to them, I stop, I put my dog into a sit and that's it. And if someone says, can I pet your dog? I say, thank you for asking, but no. So they'll never, not even, well, how about after the conversation? Can I pet your dog? No, don't let people pet your dog. Just don't let them do it. And I'm not against people petting dogs, but the point being is, Let's teach your dog right now that nobody else matters in this world but you. Mm. That's it. The owner. You, all that matters. Nobody else matters. So to stop the jumping up, yeah, you would have to correct the dog. You have to. So that's with a leash pop. Now, remote collar training is going to be wonderful. But the biggest thing is going to be is going to be practicing sits around high levels of distraction. So you have to role play it over and over and over and over again, go to public places where there's lots of people walking by. But the magic to it truly is also is just your dog doesn't think someone's going to pet it. My dogs never think someone's going to pet them. And my dogs are social. Next. Oh, right. Uh, hey, Melissa, how's it going? Um, hey, Melissa, thanks for being here. I just messed up. Okay. Train. This is from Martha. Training a very small nervous dog that is extremely skittish missed, and fleas. You, you missed a bunch of them. Did I? Right after Melissa. Oh, sorry, sorry, because I was looking at yep. this one. Yep. Oh, sorry, guys. Uh, this is from Kayla. Thoughts on pinning? My dad does it. Seems a little intense. So I, I wouldn't call it intense. We don't pin. Pinning mostly, pinning a dog is a great way to get bit. It's a wonderful way to get bit. Most people do it wrong. Um, we don't pin. Um, so I would never suggest an owner pins. Now, if your dad pins your dog and it's working for your dad, I'm not going to tell him not to do it, but I wouldn't suggest that as a, as a, as a training style or as a behavioral modification technique, um, at all. Next. Okay. Robin, leash reactive dog to other dogs. Prong collar doesn't work. Dog is conditioning to e-collar. Should I use e-collar before dog explodes? Okay. So Robin. Once the dog explodes, it's too late. If you're trying to rehabilitate somebody from alcohol, drinking alcohol, you wouldn't wait until they were drunk and then talk to them about they shouldn't drink. Correct? And I'm being serious here. When do you talk to the person about their alcohol issues? Before they pick up the first drop of alcohol. And you help them through. So when someone's in recovery and when someone's learned to not drink anymore, you address it at the first thought of drinking. With leash reactivity, you apply your punisher at the first thought of being reactive. And we can usually tell by our dog's body language. So in their breathing and their intensity. So they might be going. That's when you apply the Punisher. And I would use a remote collar for that. It's a lot easier to do that and it works a lot better. And the rehab process is much simpler. Next. This one's from Martha. What age can you do higher corrections for obedience commands? Um, what age? It all depends. It's not about the age. It's how well does the dog know the command? So when it comes to obedience, we don't apply a Punisher until, a dog, until we feel a dog knows the command. There's another part to her question. Training a very small nervous dog that is extremely skittish and flees during training, even on leash. Okay. That doesn't help me as far as the age. That's different. So nervous and age are two different things. We have nervous dogs that are eight years old. So and, and higher. So, but I'll address the nervousness. So the obedience command, it's if they know it. So we wait until they know it, but so that's technically we would apply a Punisher after about eight days of training, but that's at a training center doing it all the time. As far as a nervous, fearful dog, the best way, the most effective way, the kindest way to actually help rehabilitate nervousness and fear is actually holding the dog accountable for everything because they want to flee and a fleeing dog will get hit by a car. A fleeing dog will hide underneath the couch and you reach for it and it gets bit. So fleeing dogs are in a state of fear. I want that dog to not be in fear anymore. We deal with a ton of fearful dogs. The information you get out there will say, oh, if you punish a fearful dog, you'll make it worse. That's the biggest bunch of bullshit in the world. Number one, there's nobody's ever, whoever said that never studied it. 
and they've never done it properly. So we do it, we do it properly, and we see it get the dog out of the fear state all the time. We see dogs build confidence, and we don't see them build confidence through love and affection. We're not against love and affection, but when it comes to fear and anxiety, holding the dog accountable. That's why people have to properly learn it, learn how to punish a dog. No anger. You're not mad. It's just matter of fact. Next. All right. Uh, this one's from Stephanie. Finally getting an e-collar soon for my Husky mix. When I first start training her with it, do I layer it over the information and corrections I give with her prong? Yes, you can do that. We layer for all the obedience stuff. We layer pressure on, pressure off with the remote collar. Next. Uh, this one's from Martha as well. Small dog screams and flops around with slightest prong pressure. Use slip lead and e-collar instead. You could use a slip lead and e-collar as well. But if it's possible that the dog's just being dramatic. So prong collars don't hurt. So people have got to understand that prong collars don't hurt at all. They look barbaric, but they don't hurt. When people say, well, they look like they hurt. Okay. But they don't hurt. So, oh, I heard they hurt. You were lied to. They don't hurt. Have you put it on yourself? Well, number one, yes, I have. But what does that have to do with my dog? Nothing at all. I don't eat out of a food bowl. I don't eat dog food. You know what I mean? I take my shits in a toilet. So what my dog does and what I do are two different things. And no, I don't do it to my kids. Like those are all irrelevant. So a animal, a canine is different than our species. So the point being is it doesn't hurt. So the drama is literally drama. Next. Best way to proof recall, long lead and closed area, press and hold at a higher level, guiding dog? No, the way you would proof it would be momentary. So we do press and hold during the training process. During the proofing process, we would call the dog back if they don't respond. So if a dog is in is 30, 40, 50 feet away from you and you're doing recall, I'm going to assume, or at least they should, understand what recall is. Therefore, it's time to proof. The way you proof, you call your dog back. If it doesn't come back, we hit momentary at a higher level because it is a punisher for lack of a known command. So it's a punisher for lack of known command. The only way to get a reliable obedience command is to apply a punisher for not doing it. It's the only way to do it. So, and then, but you have the dog on a long line because a remote collar is not directional. So some dogs will run the other way. So you need to guide them. But it shouldn't be like, it's not like fishing. The dog should actually come back. Why? By the time you're proofing it, it's probably done it 250 times already successfully. Next. This one's from Noah and Lincoln. I take my dog out with prong and e-collar around high distractions. Level 75 on the boss doesn't redirect his attention. 75 in the house definitely works. E-collar is snug and high. Okay. So 75 <laughs> on a boss is pretty high. So you've got yourself an intense dog. What I would do is I would make sure the contact points are the right contact points. So there's about 10 different contact points you can get. If you've got a thicker fur dog, you want to make sure you've got the thick fur contact points. It's very, very important. You want to make sure that that collar isn't just snug, but is literally, it has to, the, the metal has to be touching skin. And then what you want to do is it's possibly that you're waiting too late in the sequence. But even if you did, 75 is pretty high. It goes up to 100. But if your dog's blowing through 100 without being in full drive, that's pretty intense. So what I would do is you have to find, make sure you're doing it way sooner in the sequence of arousal. Next. Uh, this one's from Adelie. For e-collar heel, once the dog understands the heel command and what the e-collar stim means, do you use a higher level on the e-collar and correct the dog for leaving heel? So, Adelie, great question. Again, once the dog knows a known command, which is heel, which it sounds like from your description that it does, you would have to apply a punisher for lack of compliance. So the best way to apply a punisher when it comes to remote collar for heel would be a higher level nick, which would simulate a leash pop. So you've already done the training, you've already done the proofing, you've already done, I don't know how many miles, miles of walks, correct? Now it's time for the dog to 
finally do what it's supposed to do. And it usually does. But once in a while, when it gets out of the heel command, what you would do is you would say either heel or no, and you would apply the, 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 the nick at a higher level. Your dog should go, whoa, that was pretty uh, intense. I better back up a little bit. And that's how you do it. Next. This one's from Hassan. My dog starts to attack people on street when, <laughs> sorry, when they get closer to us. And I notice that he is afraid from them. What should I do? Please. He has two years. Okay. So Hassan, <coughs> if your dog is attacking people on the street, you should have a muzzle on your dog. Um, I'm, let me also, I'm not going to assume it has a leash. So I just won't assume that anymore. So make sure your dog is leashed. It should be leashed. You, can have, you should have a muzzle on your dog and you should teach your dog how to walk properly next to you. And you want to make sure that nobody tries to pet your dog and you're going to want to use space. So this is not like the full training. This is a very short answer to make sure that people don't get attacked. Because if I was walking down the street and your dog attacked me, and I'm not a violent person, don't get me wrong, I assure you, it would not be pretty because I can't let dogs attack me because I've got the right to walk down public streets. So um, so that's why you're calling in. I want to be helpful, but that's a very long answer that I have to give you. And it's not going to be done on this 15 second answer. So I would think about joining my Patreon page. Also people, there's a little dollar sign down there. I know people have super chat. People have clicked that stuff happens. So, so good stuff happens to me if someone presses super chat. So feel free to super chat me. Um, now what you can do is, so if you're not using a prong collar, have a prong collar on your dog, um, teach your dog how to properly heal. Make sure your dog is walking next to you. It's not out in front of you. Start with all those things. So start with some of my simple do-it-yourself videos. Please get a good fitting muzzle. Get a basket muzzle. And don't let your dog make contact with people. Next. All right. This one's from Holly. Got my two Huskies dialed in, doing great on and off practice for two weeks. Females responding to off-leash healing in controlled environment. How soon is it too soon to start expecting that? Well, I mean, all, it all depends on how much training you're doing. So off-leash healing in busy places, though, we actually don't do that. And I've seen all the videos out there. They look great. There's nothing, I'm not, there's nothing against people that are doing it. None of our clients, though, want to off-leash heal in city centers, farmers market, crowded places. It's a little bit of a sleight of hand because it's a highly structured environment. So, but if you wanna start role playing, you know, off leash healing, that all depends on how well the dog is doing with basic healing and also what behavioral issues the dog struggled with in the past. If you've got a dog that's lunged at people, I would never do it, it's unethical. So, you know, but, but if you wanna do it, it's like, let the dog tell you, let the dog tell you, next. Uh, hi, Kim. How are you doing? Good to see you. Uh, the next question is from uh, Arlen. Oh, hey, Kim. How are you? Uh, hello. What do you do for a dog that keeps spilling his water bowl? Um, I would. There's a couple of things. Number one, the dog is not allowed free access to water. The dog's not allowed free access to water. I would also look into a water bucket that can be clipped onto something. So they make buckets. You can clip them onto something. What you can do is during mealtime, um, you can um, you can give your dog water and then you can take it away. Um, dogs do not need 24 hour access to, to water. Now, my dogs have 24 hour access to water. Why? They don't they hold it overnight and they don't spill their water. So they behave accordingly. Um, when I'm in my RV, though, traveling in my RV. So this week I'm in my RV um, after, on Wednesday. I'll be in my RV for eight days. My dogs will not have free access to water. What I'll do is I'll give them a bunch of water with their with their meals, and then they'll have little water breaks. But it's also, I'm not out in 110 degree weather either. Um, but a dog doesn't need to have constant water. If it's spilling it, it's, it's you know, not behaving properly. So let's limit the access to it. Next. Um, this one's from Kayla. My dog yelps very loud when I put my e-collar on stim to correct him growling. It's a massive scene and very humiliating. I've pretty much been putting my e-collar on loose so it's not full contact. Okay. So Kayla, then take off your e-collar. So so don't please don't use the tool inappropriately. All right. I'm not mad at you, Kayla. So so your dog should have the e -collar. So putting it on loose is a disservice to your dog. If anything, you would just dial it down. Make sure your e-collar is on properly. So if your dog is is correcting the growling, you can do a, there's, you can if it's making that much of a scene, it's possibly that your levels are too high. If your levels are too high, 
As far as being humiliating, I can't tell you not to be humiliated, but dogs don't make us humiliated. Just keep in mind. So from a personal growth standpoint, nobody can make us humiliated. Nobody can. All right. So that's, that comes, that comes from within. Does it make you a bad person? I don't know if you listen to me long enough to know me well enough. And, and we, and we, and we, we have those conversations, but I have conversations openly a lot about personal growth, becoming a better human being, how to deal with a lot of different things in life. But what I would do is check to make sure your levels are not too um, uh, uh, high. Now, if someone's brand new to my show, you might hear that, oh, you're not supposed to crest correct growling. 99% of the time, yes, you are. So a lot of trainers will say, don't correct the growling because then there'll be no warning. Trust me, you correct the growling, you correct the biting, you correct the thought of growling and the thought of biting. So next. Mm -hmm. uh, this one's from AJ. Hey, AJ. Nine-month-old dog does well with walks, having trouble with breaking heel when someone comes from behind and posturing, change of breathing when seeing other dogs, e-collar and prong collar trained. So what I would do is as soon as that dog changes its posture, that's when you give that dog an e collar correction. What it does is it breaks that dog's mindset and puts them back in, and puts them back into heel. Make sure you're giving that dog lots of guidance on this stuff, though. Remember, remote collars are not directional. They're not directional at all. So what you want to do is you want to role play this. Role play it, role play it, role play it. So as soon as that dog starts getting out of focus and it starts getting tense, tense is probably a is, is the first sequence possibly of loading, and then the dog will explode. So what you want to do is you want to eliminate that. You want to eliminate that. Next. Uh, this is from, I don't know how to say it. Yep. Uh, starting crate training, what behaviors do I correct while he is kenneled? Uh, what level should I correct at? So as far as, so that's a, there's a very question there. So you're starting crate training. I need to, it's not just about correcting. So what do you correct at? This is, this is what you do. Proper crate behavior is go into a crate, lie down and be quiet. That's the proper crate behavior. So any barking, any whining, any trying to get out. And there's a bunch of ways you can stop it. You can walk up to the crate and just Hit the top of the crate. You could, um, you can shake the crate. You can use a pet convincer, which is compressed air. You can use the remote collar. What you're going to do is with a remote collar, you are going to figure out what the right level is. Pay attention to your dog. Always listen to the dog. What's the dog telling you? The last thing I want anybody to do is just start pushing buttons. I want them to understand how the button is connected to the dog's behavior and how it's connected to stopping the dog's unwanted behavior. And now some people are gonna say, never punish a dog in a crate because it's supposed to be a happy place. That's a bunch of bullshit. Number one, the dog is already having a negative association. Just because you put in a padded dog bed, stuffed toys, some beautiful music and filtered water, the dog's not gonna go, oh, and pictures of like, you know, mountain streams, the dog's not gonna go, oh, this is my happy place, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna stop whining. Dogs are whining. Why? Because that's what dogs do in crates. So you make it suck to whine. You make it suck to bark. You make it suck to try to break out of a crate. Next. Okay. Uh, you just got $2 from Patrick. Holy shit. Patrick, thank you. That's amazing. Damn. Look at that. <coughs> Hungry Animal Foundation says, hello, Jeff and Linda. Great to see you. Oh, both. Hungry Animal Good Foundation. To Great to see you. All right. Here's one from Lynn. 90 pound American bulldog having meltdowns, walking by squirrels, prong collar corrections seem to make him fight harder. I'm only a hundred pounds. Time for e-collar. Oh gosh. Yeah. Yeah. You have a 90 pound American bully that, um, um, that's freaking out with squirrels, e-collar and, and, and learn, and learn how to do e-collar heel. Absolutely. Your life will change. Um, next. Yes. Next. Sorry. Next. Simon. Been stimulating high on walks whenever I see him fixate on other dogs. He is no longer leash reactive. How do I get him to uh, engage friendly with other dogs without having trained dogs at my okay. disposal? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Simon, never on a leash. So never on a leash. We're never going to have the dog meet dogs on leashes. Ever. Ever. Friendly or not friendly. Ever. Now, in a structured environment, so that would be... You know, if you've got a doggy daycare, which I'm not a big fan of most doggy daycares, please don't go to dog parks. Your average dog park that's like the size of this room or maybe twice the size of this room um, is not good. There are some 10 acre dog parks, but even those are, pre are pretty dangerous. So if you want to have little play sessions, play groups with some people you meet, you can do like a meetup. 
ask some people on Facebook, um, some like-minded people that also think like you do that know that any bad behavior has to be corrected. You want to put a little mixer of your own together. That's what I suggest. The way you greet them is first you can go for a walk, but also understand the dog's behavior. Has your dog got into dog fights? Has their dog got into dog fights? What's their play styles like? There's a lot of different, a lot of different variables, but I just want to make sure it's clear. Never on walks. Next. This one's from Kayla. There's a new argument I heard the other day from pure positive trainers. That then, yeah, I, I'm probably not going to answer this, but go ahead. That zoo animals are trained only with clickers, so you shouldn't need tools for domestic dogs. What are your thoughts? Kayla, okay, Kayla. Like one thing has to do, not do with another. It's a bunch of bullshit. It's this. It's not a new argument, by the way. It's a 40 year old argument, and it's a crock of shit. And I can't tell you how many zoo handlers dogs that I've freaking trained and vets dogs that I've trained and, 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 and animals in zoos and SeaWorld are, 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 are starved. They're, they're starved and they're also contained. And it's, you can't compare the same species to each other. It's a bunch of bullshit, right? Whoever says that, I love to have them come down to our, my training center and show me how to train dogs, right? They can't. They've got no videos training difficult dogs at all. Next. Okay. And by the way, we use clickers and food to train dogs. For full clarification, we use clickers and food to train dogs. Every dog on our property is marker trained. You cannot stop an unwanted behavior and either can the zoo. Ask the zoo how to stop an orangutan from eating its own shit. Ask the zookeeper, how do you stop an orangutan from eating its own shit today? And I'm being serious, today, not in a month. You can't take a month. It has to be stopped in one day. How do you stop a orangutan from gouging out the eyes of another orangutan today? And you have to keep them in the same area. Ask them. They can't. Next. All right. So it's not a new argument. It's the same old bullshit argument. Next. Martha says, perfect. Thanks for your help. As always, Jeff. Thanks, you're Linda. Welcome. Thank you. Sorry, welcome. New Moon. You were probably rude to me. That's mm -hmm. why you got that's why you got deleted. They got by Felicia. Yeah. All right. If you guys want to be rude on my show, I've been doing this for a long time. You, I got you got there's, there's nothing new you can insult me with. There's nothing new. I've heard it all before, guys. Go on. All right. Susan. Have you ever e-collar trained a greyhound? Is this something you would recommend? Yeah, I do, especially for recall. Especially for recall, yeah. especially for not chasing white little fluffy things. I'm being serious. So with greyhounds, we don't with the only thing that we've not done with greyhounds, believe it or not, we're not really big on teaching a greyhound to sit. Because um, a lot of these ex-racing dogs, they struggle sometimes with that. Sometimes greyhounds struggle with going up and up and down steps. That's easily fixed in, fixed in one session. Um, but absolutely, you can train a greyhound um, on a remote collar. Next. Uh, this is from Linny. Would love to see more dog owners join Patreon, and it has a community to share and ask questions. Yeah, that'd be great. Go to patreon.com slash solid training. Thank you, Linny. Uh, Pack in Harmony says, hello, I'm working with a former client of yours, different dog. Awesome. Congratulations. That's great, Pack in Harmony. That's wonderful. Um. R Pro. Tell them we said hi. Hi. R Pro. What methods do you use to get on the place bed if he is very scared of it? Um, just leash pressure. Just leash pressure. The same method we use, the same method we use, um, uh, it would be with a leash. If a dog is so afraid, it won't take food. So you probably can't use food. So just leash pressure. And if it's a raised pet bed, if it's a raised cot, turn it over so it's flat or start on something that's flat. Now, a lot of people are like, oh, well, it's afraid of it because it doesn't know what it is. It's a fucking piece of, it's a piece of bedding. It doesn't need to know what it is. Hey, dog, this is a piece of bedding. It was made in North Korea. It wasn't made in North Korea. It was, it was, it was made, it was imported from Asia. It cost $19.99. We got it wholesale for $9.99. Like dogs don't need to know that. That's some people are like, oh, it needs, it's, it's afraid of it because it doesn't know what is it is. It doesn't know what it is. Your, your average basic balanced dog doesn't know what a lot of things are and they're not afraid of them. So when you've got a dog that's fearful, the best thing you can do is lead them and guide them and show them. And you can get a dog that's afraid of a dog bed to go on a dog bed in about three minutes. Next, happily. Next. Mm -hmm. 
This is from Hungry Animal Foundation. Oh. Just got my e-collar the other day. It's fantastic. It has four settings, light, beep, vibrate, and shock. For the moment, I use it on vibrate. Okay. It's great. So just to let you know, we don't use vibrate. And if you want to use vibrate, that's fine. I've had more dogs piss themselves on vibrate. Um, you can absolutely use vibrate. A lot of people use vibrate, though, because um, they feel that it's gentler. But but to me, shock, if you get shock that goes from zero to 100, depending on the brand, there's some not so great remote cowers out there. And there's some cowers out there that run too hot, even in the lowest level. So e cower technology um, um, is, is a great one. Dogtra is a great one as well. And we do shock. And also the downfall of Vibrate is it can't increase historically. So if a dog's in drive, they don't even feel it. They don't even feel it. Um, as far as using sound, sound has no meaning. A lot of people use sound as a precursor to a punisher. But remember, sound um, doesn't mean anything. If my dogs heard a sound right now, they wouldn't know what to do. Next. But I'm glad that you're going down the that path, um, Hungry Animal Foundation. This one's from Holly. What's the difference between a gentle leader and a slip lead leash? When would you use the difference? I haven't really researched yet. Two different things. Um, a gentle leader is a is considered a head harness, so it goes over the nose, and a slip lead is just a basically it looks like a noose, and it's a slip lead, and it just goes around the neck. Next. Um, this is from our pro. Just curious, how much does a girl slash Kira caliber puppy cost? And how did you find the breeder? Anywhere from $3,500 to $5,000. But I didn't get her as a puppy. I got her as a two-year-old green dog out of the Czech Republic through the Netherlands. And I found her through a Navy SEAL friend of mine who um, gets dogs for um, military purposes as well as private vendors. So, um, but you can get any, any, and she was imported. Um, and a lot of people give me shit on that, but, but people spend more than that on a boarding train. So, you know, to each, to each their own. Um, but it's really great having a dog that has been, um, verified for health, um, and temperament and is pretty incredible dog. Next. Um, this one's from Queen Cree. Hey, Queen. After my dog is huffing and puffing and a pop to the prong doesn't work, what approach should I take? So as far as huffing and puffing, if it, it's literally queen, if it's literally huff and puff, you know, you, you sort of want to get before the huff and puff. So we like remote cowers because remote cowers, we can adjust them a little bit more than, than, than a leash pop. A lot of times a leash pop actually underwhelm dogs. Sometimes they actually can take dogs and they can actually drive them more. Sometimes dogs can be frustrated by them. So there's limitations to all tools, you know, but a remote cower though has got a lot of massive uh, lack of limitations. There's a lot of things that remote cowers can do. So what I would do is I would start recognizing what the big environmental is that your dog is it, that it's triggering on. And then what I don't avoid them, that's going to be my tip of the day today. Actually, I'm going to record later about like a lot of trainers say, avoid all conflict with your dog. It's like, mm, welcome to the world. Um, so <laughs> what, I, what you want to do is find out what it is, but I would use a remote collar next. All right. Sorry, I'm wiggling around, Jeff. It's okay. My butt hurts on this chair. Um, this one's from Jake. My dog will throw herself into situations when other dogs are quarreling, yeah. often barking at them to get their attention onto herself. It seems to me she's trying to break up the fight. Thoughts? So, Jake, <coughs> don't don't humanize it too much. So, you know, she's throwing herself into a situation to get attention. That's not what your dog is doing. What your dog is doing is it's engaging with some activity. That's it. So tell your dog to mind its own effing business and shut up, right? That's it. That's pretty much in a nutshell, right? It's like, mind your business and shut up. So if, if the last thing I want my dog to do is to get involved with any sort of dog nonsense, especially that's not my dog's, right? So what I would do is I would tell my dog to knock it off. If you have a remote cower and if your dog is off leash, you would say no and call your dog back to you. But it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a safety thing. It's a safety thing. Also, the last thing I want your dog to do, those other two dogs to do or multiple dogs to do, is to turn on your dog, which also could happen. Next. I'm not sure what this next question yep. says. Best thing to do when a dog is objecting to prong collar? First. Hint. Oh, hint. Of giving it a pop. Oh, all right. You're, you're good. So, um, so what, I, what, I would, what I would do is, is um, make sure you introduce the collar properly by doing a little prong collar dance. 
Um, your dog might also just be dramatic. We, we see a lot of dogs that are just dramatic. Just remember the prong collar doesn't hurt. There's that conversation out there and I talked about it earlier in the show where, where, where people think, oh, it's objecting it to because it's hurt. I have dogs that have ejected to every training tool out there. It's objecting. That's all it is. It's all it is. So what I would do is I would teach that you work your dog through it. How do you work your dog through it? You can actually use a bonker. Bonker is a towel. It all depends on what the objection looks like. If it's some dogs will bite the leash, some dogs will do crocodile rolls, some dogs will be overly dramatic. It's overall arousal. It's an objection. You can actually use a bonker. You can actually correct a dog that's freaking out. Next. Uh, this one's from Bonnie. My dog has learned to scream in his crate and bark when he wants out. Haven't been able to find a video on fixing a learned behavior. Any tips? His e-collar will either have no effect or amplify it. Okay. So, Bonnie, almost all my videos are to fix known behaviors. That's all I talk about all day long, Bonnie. So, for full clarification, every one of my Q&As is to stop an unwanted behavior. So, what you need to do is this. Any dog that's screaming in the crate, it's you've got to if, – if you might be underwhelming the dog. So, if the dog is ignoring the remote or amplifying it, believe it or not, you're underwhelming the dog. You've got to cap the arousal. You've got to cap the arousal and squash it. So what you're probably doing is chasing it or pushing the arousal. You're, that's what you're doing. It's very, very common. So what you want to do is dogs, dogs, non, we, we do a dog nonsense and crate all the time. Our kennels are nice and quiet. So what you're going to do is anytime a dog is being overly aroused in a crate, you can go up to the, you can use the remote and you're going to play with your numbers. You can start out high. If it puts the dog into defense, which happens sometimes, you can always, what you can also do is walk over to the crate, open up the door a tiny bit. The dog tries to come out, slam the door in the dog's face. Believe it or not, you do that. That, that, that stuns them. You can have the dog come out, have the dog on a leash, have the dog come out, give them a leash correction, have them come out, bonk them. All this stuff sounds mean to a lot of people, but if you've got a dog that's really bad in the crate, it's horrific. It's horrific, and they can destroy crates. They can self-harm themselves. Next. Um, this is from our pro. Do you use a prong collar for leash pressure when teaching a dog to swim? Yes, we do. Yeah, I got three videos on, on uh, three videos on teaching a dog to swim, and it shows exactly how we do it. Next. This one's from Robin. When you get a new problem dog, do you have an SOP, or do the trainers get together and develop a different plan for each dog? Um, depends on what the issue is. Depends on what the issue is, Robin. Um, you know, uh, most most dogs come in and they sort of get, you know, baseline stuff. If there's any dangerous behaviors that are happening, we have to stop those right away. But most dogs will read the temperament of the dog and will, ju and will just start training. But absolutely, the trainers get together and they, they, they talk about the dog. But it's not this long, sophisticated plan. The real plan happens two, three, four, five days into training. Next. Uh, this one's from Adelie. For a dog that already knows the recall command, would you only need to do a few conditioning sessions with the e-collar before starting to proof the command using the e-collar? Um, more than a few. Well, a few is three or more. So, you know, just because they know recall, that doesn't mean recall and an e-collar is a little bit different. It's something they've never felt before. So be careful and don't rush it. Next. Um, this one's from Nick. How can I get my dog to pay attention like in Schutzund? Well, only, not just Schutz. I mean, Schutzund dogs don't just pay attention. That's just doing focus work. That's just doing focus work. What you can do is look up some videos on focus, focus work in Schutzund. Um, but what you can do is it's all a lot of it's done with a clicker and food. Next. Uh, Missy May says you are the best, Jeff. Hey, Missy. Hey, Missy. Love you. Don't get, <coughs> don't get rid of your house. Next. Um, Robin says, dog dude, what is the first thing you would do? My name is Jeff Robin. Come on. Rescue dogs that have supposed bite histories. The first thing I teach them is depends if they're, first of all, a rescue dog with a bite history, unfortunately probably isn't going to survive because where do you adopt them out to? I'm, I'm really transparent about that. Um, but what, what you do is you still got to obedience train them. You got to obedience train them. So what you're going to do with that, with a, with a, with a dog, with a bite history is, if as long as it's safe to handle, start training it on obedience. As long as it's safe to handle, train it on obedience. It's the best thing to do um, in massive amounts of structure. And don't give that dog any 
any overly affection at all and probably minimal affection. Next. Uh, Patrick says, where does the e-collar sit on my 18 month old Ridgely below her head in front of the Adam's apple or behind it? I have a strange fear that the collar is sitting on her Adam's apple. I pull it tight up to her jaw. No, it's in the wrong spot side and all my how to videos we show right there and right there, right there, right there. And the name of the dog and the breed, of the dog don't matter. It's right there or the age it's right there. And it's right there. Next. Um, Lynn says, thank you, Jeff and Linda. You're welcome. Yep. Um, Lori, isn't a dominant collar and a slip lead similar? What's the difference? Thanks. Um, a slip lead is a long slip lead. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a piece of string, basically rope. It's a combination of leash and um, a collar. And a dominant dog collar is size. They come anywhere from 12 inches to 24 inches by two inch increments. And they're made to, they can't slip over the dog's head. They shouldn't slip over the dog's head. They have to get, they go un, around and hooked because there's only a tiny bit of little tail at the very end that is left. And they clip on, clip onto that. Dominant dog collar is used to take out the drive in dogs almost instantly with minimal leash pressure up. Next. Um, this one's from Bonnie. One more question. How do I get my dog not to hump other dogs? He doesn't hump my other two at home, only dogs outside the house. Thank you. You can, you, we use dressage whips, <laughs> dressage, or we actually, it's called a stockyard whip and we whack their butt with it. You can also use a remote collar for that, but I don't want your dog to be corrected on a remote collar for the first time for humping around a strange dog. Uh, I want to make sure that dog understands exactly what it's be, what it what it feels like. But um, humping your dog's going to end up possibly humping the wrong dog and getting into a dog fight. Um, it's really bad for a dog to do. It's not a sex thing. Females do it. Males do it. Dogs that are fixed do it. And there's plenty of dogs out there that are not fixed that don't do it. So um, it's just more of a bad behavior. It's a more of a bad behavior. So we 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 just, some sort of punisher is how you stop it. It takes two seconds to stop stop pumping. Next. Okay, this one's from Robin. Best thing to do with a dog that has never been on a leash. She's about eight months old. Clients have her for about have had her for about three weeks. She totally shuts down when putting a leash on her. She has no socialization. So what I would do is with no no leash, probably a slip lead to start, but you're gonna to want to transfer over to a prong collar really quick. So I've worked with feral dogs, not fearful, truly feral dogs. And a lot of people say, Oh, I own a feral dog. It's like you probably don't because it's a feral dog and, and, and believe it or not, the prong collar was the most gentlest thing and easiest thing to have a conversation with, but probably a slip lead for the first couple of days. Next. Uh, this one's from Lori. Do bulldogs and pugs have issues with their breathing and is it okay to put prongs on them? Of course they do. They absolutely do. And yes, it's okay to put prongs on them. Next. This one's from Jamal. Yep. Understanding tools don't train what small dogs cannot have prongs and remote collars. I'm not sure what. And for the hell of it, would you prefer using as far as, I, I don't understand the question. Jamal, write, write, the, Jamal, write the, your sentences in better structure. So with small <laughs> dogs, with tiny, tiny dogs, you can use a 1.75 millimeter prong. You can still use a remote collar. We click or train all dogs anyway. Um, you can do that. You can use a bonker on a small dog. Um, but even, you know, six pound dog, you're, you're going to struggle with a, with, with a remote collar, but you can use a, a micro prong collar and you can use, you can do just about everything you can with a small dog as you can a bigger dog. Next. Mm -hmm. This is from our pro. Is there anything worse than the harness and flexi leash combo joke? But I see this daily. There's a lot worse, but that's a pretty bad one. Next. <coughs> This one's from Holly. All your Q&As and videos are so encouraging that things can always be better. So thankful. Yep, Holly. Things can always get better. Yep. Proud of you. Next. NZ Trainer says, hi, Jeff and Linda. Hello. Hello. Uh, this one's from James. Any tip on transitioning from a prong collar to a flat collar? Dog heals well on prong, but pulls again when switching back to the flat buckle. Yeah, James. Don't switch. And I'm being serious. Why switch? A lot of dog trainers will try to shame you that, oh, if your dog was well-trained enough, it shouldn't need the prong collar. That's the, a total lack of empathy on the owner. Stick to the prong collar. It works. And I'm being serious. Stick to the prong collar. It works just fine. It, it, work, it works fine. Remote collar, heal your dog as well. Maybe you can go back to a, a different collar. But to me, my goal is not to get off dog's prongs. My goal is to make people's lives easier. That's my goal. Next. So I'm the wrong guy to ask, technically. Next. This is from Stan. 
I have a two-year-old Doberman. My daughter's boyfriend got a puppy, a German Shepherd, and my Doberman gets very aggressive at the puppy. What's the best way to get them to get along? So right now, keep them apart. I don't want anything bad to happen with that, that new puppy or else it'll end up being a, a, a shit show of a dog later in life. Um, so th th that's a very complicated, that's a very complicated answer that I would hate to give you not a hundred percent of the information on this. A lot of the po folks here are asking questions actually that need actually an hour to answer. That's why we've got our Patreon page set up. So the best thing to do right now, keep them away from each other until you get more information. Don't try to make them be friends because your, your dog is not a good puppy greeter. Your dog is not a good puppy greeter at all. And the last thing I need that puppy to do is learn that dogs are going to be aggressive. It will be, it'll be, a, it'll be, it'll be a really, really bad thing. So um, what you want them to do is they could be around each other, but don't have them interacting. But I would be super careful because that puppy can get killed or hurt instantly. And it's happened. It happens all the time. Next. Um, AJ. Says, I know that wasn't the full answer that you're looking for. AJ asks, when layering e collar and prong, which one is on top? Um, uh, prong collar on the top, remote collar underneath. Next. Um, sir, chirp a lot. Yeah. Big thank you to Jeff and the whole team at Solid Canine. Yep. Um, Patrick says no, the strap itself. I don't know what that means. I don't know what yep. that must go with another question. Yep. Uh, Ashley, how can I get collars on easier when they are in their kennels? They are perfect if they already have them. Rush the door if not. I've done all the steps and get them on, put them back, suggestions. Um, if your dog's rushing the front door, the door, slam the door, slam the doors. Are you talking about the, cow, the kennel door? Yeah, the kennel door. Um, open up the kennel door, the dogs rush it, slam it really hard, have the dog sit down, have the dogs lie down, put the equipment on the dog. Next. Okay, Patrick, was you were talking about the positioning of the prong collar. Yeah. You know, he said... I keep the device on the top of her neck. I meant where does the strap sit below on her neck in front or behind no, her? No, 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 no. Patrick, Patrick, the box of the remote collar, it's a muscle stimulator. It sits, okay, it's all one piece, strap and box. At the end, when it's on the dog, and I've got, look, look at all of our videos, look at all of our photos. It's right there. The box is right there. The box is right there. Take the pick. Take a side. Either this side or this side. The strap goes around the whole dog's neck. It's a it's a regular collar. Or maybe I'm confused. But the box is right there or right there. Not behind the not behind the dog's neck, and not here. Next. Oh, sorry. Um. This is from Kayla. My dog growls when picked up or handled too much. I've noticed an overall. He now dreads handling since I've been correcting persistently. Quieter but unhappy. We went to the vet and they said it wasn't pain. So I would clicker train and counter condition <laughs> your dog. It's going to be done with clicker and food and counter conditioning. And you're going to get your dog to love being picked up because that's how they're going to eat for the next three weeks. One little step at, the time, at a time. Next. Bonnie says, thanks again. You guys are awesome. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, Onyx. How do I get my 100-pound dog in the car? He got his tail shut in the door and is now scared. I do use a prong collar. So, Onyx, what I would do is – I don't blame the dog. I mean, that's, and that's a big freaking dog. So what you're going to do is you're going you're gonna to have to use – you can try using food. Some people will throw food in and the dog will go it. But if the dog's afraid, it won't take food. So if a dog won't take food, in the hell if you're picking up a 100-pound dog, what are you going to use? You have to use compulsion, which is force. So we do it. We do it successfully. And you can take a long line and you can throw it through the door. So it's on, you're on the other side and you're going to get some help. So you've got your dog on a leash and you're next to your dog. And a buddy of yours is on the other side of the vehicle with a long line. And you both walk up, you, you walk up like this and your buddy's also pulling the leash and you're like, let's go. And you go. We've done that. The first couple of times are ugly. It's not pretty. But once the dog knows that you can get the dog in the car, it goes every single time. We've done that not thousands of times, but hundreds of times successfully. Next. All right. This one's from Kayla. Hi, Jeff. My dog cowers from his harness, even though I always put it on before walks. From what I've been told, he should be excited when he sees it. Well, I don't know him about being excited, but 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 maybe the, like we don't use harnesses to walk dogs. So why don't you use a prong collar? 
to walk your dog. We don't use harnesses, but I don't know. I don't know why he, I don't know why he cowers, but we don't walk dogs in harnesses because harnesses usually make dogs pull. So I don't know why he's doing it. I don't know why. There's probably a lot of other variables, Kayla. Next. Jamal says, damn autocorrect using swipe text. What small dogs cannot have tools on their necks? And for the hell of it, what tools would you use on those type of dogs? Great, Jamal. Why don't you take the freaking time and type us a question properly, please? Okay. Don't. All right. So. Stop. So. <laughs> Jamal, don't worry about it. All right. So, um, like I said, anywhere between like six to eight pounds, sometimes remote collars. There's no good small dog remote collar on the market yet. Hey, Greg, make one, please. All we'll, right. We'll test it. All right, please. Come on, Greg. I saw a lot of your shit. All right. Um, so, but you can use a 1.75 millimeter um, uh, 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 prong collar. Yep. Next. Uh, this one's from Mo. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Linda. Dog freaks out when a bus passes by, but only when the bus approaches from behind us. I correct with a no and give the heel command. Any training tips to get over the fear? Yeah, that's a good way to start. That's a good way to start. <coughs> and what you can do is start using distance. So start a little bit farther away. Work your way closer. Start also doing food and clicker engagement games. All right. Next. This We're on the bus. Next. This one's from Eric. Yep. E-collar leash training. I've been walking her on my right side, and now I want her on my left. But when I take the leash off, she will only walk on my right. Any suggestions on how I can get her on my left? Yeah, you're going to teach. Or should I train her to walk on left and right side? And if sh if so, what should I use for a command word? So you can, I was going to say, teach how to do both sides. So when I used to do that, I don't do that anymore. So I would use foos for my left and vlock for my right. They're just words. It doesn't matter. You don't have to be like, how do you spell that, Jeff? Because it doesn't matter. You can say heel and you can say anything else. You can say walk. You can say heel and foos. Go, go on to different, look up different heel words in different vocabularies, um, in different languages. There's Dutch, there's German, there's French, there's English, common, common competition, common competition words. But train both, and then you can have your dog mid-walk switch. So they switch from side to side, and you do that with a leash. Next. Okay, this one's from Kayla. Is there a right, right way to condition a bark collar? I've been feeling very tempted. No. My friend says it ruined her dog and made it afraid and neurotic. Is it possible she did it wrong? She probably did it wrong. You don't condition a dog to a bark collar because the only way it, work, it gets activated is it barks. It's possibly that it was always set too high in your friend or she used a crappy bark collar. We don't see dogs becoming neurotic to bark collars when you – you put it on properly. The way you put on a bark collar is we use the Garmin Bark Limiter, e-collar technologies, or Dogtra. You start at the lowest level. You put it on nice and snug. That does go towards the front because that's based on vibration. And you, like, knock on the door. The dog barks, barks, barks. It's too low. Go up a notch. Knock on the door. The dog barks. Ow! And then stops barking. There you go. Right level. Next. Okay. If it's a cheap pro, if it's a cheap <laughs> mark collar, it might get activated when it's not supposed to, and that'll also make your dog neurotic. Next. This one's from Stan. Hey, Jeff, I've been using prong collar with great success. My dog heals as soon as I stop, and I have great su success with the e collar. Thanks for all your good work, Stan from Jacksonville, Florida. Awesome. Thanks, Stan, for the kind words. This one's from Bob. Hey, Bob. Jeff, I just want to let everyone know how great and nice you are. We had a terrible problem with our biting bulldog. Jeff spent a half hour on the phone with us. And we want to thank him again for oh, kindness. Thanks, Bob. That was nice. This one's from Patrick. Got it. Thank you. Love the demo. <laughs> You're welcome, Patrick. Bob yeah. says Jeff is a great human being. Thanks, Bob. Wait, I wasn't that the guy you sent the check to, that big check? No. <laughs> I sent them uh, naked pictures of you, though. They wouldn't <laughs> be saying thank you. Speaking of naked pictures, okay. hey, Megan. <laughs> what? You're a sick person, Jeffrey. Onyx says thanks. Thank you. You're the best. Megan. <laughs> Hi, Megan. Don't. 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 Come on. Don't acknowledge this nonsense. Let's, My eye is itchy, you guys. Um, can dogs be allergic to the metal contact solution if that's the problem? Yeah, they can. So they make a nickel, they make a nickel free contact point, Megan. Love you, Megan. Next. Uh, this is from Chris. Greyhound stops when leash hits his leg. What to do? Wait it out until he moves. It's every single time. Greyhound stops when leash hits his wait. Greyhound stops when leash hits its heel. What to do? Wait until he moves. Hits his leg. 
stuff. The, lo- the leash must touch the dog by so, accident. Oh, so get the leash. I don't know why the dog is doing it. I don't know. Maybe the dog learned it from some greyhound training. I have no idea why at all. But don't have hanging leashes. We're, we're, we talk about that all the time, about hanging leashes. It does irritate dogs. So just the leash should be up and coming from the neck to you, and there should be nothing hanging underneath. Next. But I wouldn't wait for the dog. I would move the dog. Next. Totally. All right. Um, Johnny. Yep. Would working for Rover as a sitter or walker be a good start when wanting to be a dog trainer? That's up to you, buddy. Some people do. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I just... You know, I know some people that are doing it as dog for dog walking and pet sitting. You know, that's a good way to start working with lots of dogs. Uh, that wouldn't be the way that I would go about and do it. But right now, um, I see a lot of people do it and a lot of people are having fun with it. Um, so I couldn't give you advice on that because I don't know enough about it. Next. Um, those I don't have any more questions. Oh, there we go. Oh, here, here we go. 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 Um, Jamal, Johnny, most people aren't interested. Hmm. Okay. But that's just Jamal's experience, right? That's Jamal's experience. Jamal's a good guy, by the way. I like Jamal. Jamal is one of my regulars, just for everybody knows. Jamal is a really great guy. He's on my Patreon channel. That's not why he's a great guy, but he's a really, really great guy. He's a he's a he's a young dog trainer. He's a he's a he's a he's a great father um or husband. I think I don't know if he has any kids. Oh, they're pregnant. Yeah, he's pregnant. I mean, his wife are pregnant. Congratulations, Jamal. That's awesome. Um, but in Jamal's neighborhood or in Jamal's area, Rover might not be big. But in other places, it might be. Next. Missy May says, you're still hiring? It's a smiley, toothy face. Um, yes, Missy, we are. But I'm getting some really good, really, really good resumes in. And I've got to start calling people back uh, this week. But i got to head up to Canada. So I might not be able to do it until next week. Next. Megan says, LOL. Thanks. Yes. Um, that's funny emojis. They look different than the yep. ones I've ever seen. Next. Um, Simon, I'm using prong collar. My dog walks politely in heel around our neighborhood, but once I drive them to a different area, they start to pull a bit. E-collar doesn't seem to slow them down. So remember, because Simon, the e-collar is not directional. So they still have to learn what the e-collar is. So it's possible that you've got to just give a firm correction at the very beginning, have one good conversation, mm. cut the shit, guys. Like it's time to it's time to behave. And um, and then do that. That's probably what it is. Next. Yeah. Look what you got. All right, Eric. Eric had two bucks. Score. Awesome. Nice cash money. Oh, you can buy me a coffee. Nice. <laughs> uh, Melissa, when you guys work on place duration, do you just leave them on a tie back and correct if they break command? No, I tie backs are there. Is sort of I mean they do it at the center lot because there's so many dogs out. But when there's not a lot of dogs out, we don't do that at all. Place duration, what we do is the way to get a place duration is punishment for lack of compliance. Once a dog knows it, the only way they're going to stay for long periods of time is if they break, there's some sort of consequence. So um, always have a leash on the dog. You would say no. You mark as soon as they leave place. The no is very important. Punisher can be delivered afterwards. But yes, that's how you fix it. Next. Um, This is from Lion's Roar. I'm an owner training a service dog, and he isn't really responsive to treats. Any advice? So lions were, what I would do is I would use do food training. If you're training any dog at all, do food training. Use the dog's daily food, daily food to work. Use their daily food to work. So if they're eating out of a bowl, um, they might be overeating. We don't know. Um, I would use, I would switch to, they work for their daily food. Teach them everything with their daily food. Next. Uh, Nick asks, is it okay for my dog to get happy when people approach, but not pull at them or should she completely ignore them? Um, that's, that's personal choice. That's personal choice. It depends what happy means. If happy means aroused and excited, I don't want my dogs to do that. I don't want my dogs to do that. And that's just my opinion, but it's a lot of my colleagues' opinions. I want my dogs to be neutral around people because when my dog's off leash, I don't want them to think people are something they can go up to or run to. I want my dog to be focused on me. So next. Uh, Chris says, I was talking when working recall with the Greyhound. I'm going to have him walk in the house with his leash on. Oh, 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 I see. When the leash is dragging, they stop. I know a lot of dogs will do that. That's hard. That's co- that's common. So you have to get on that dog on remote collar as soon as possible. Or yes, keep moving. You have to guide it. You're going to have to guide it. I've seen dogs do that. So Waiting for them to do it, you might have to wait them out. So that's where it's going to be very complicated. I have a dog that has a leash drag and they step on it. They sort of feel tension if that's what you're talking about. So what I would do is you have to prevent that from happening, which sort of limits now 
your, your, your training technique. Next. This one's from Camden. Dog freaks out when family members jump in the lake and tries to save us. <coughs> Ends up scratching people. Should we train an avoidance behavior, downstay, and desensitize at a distance? Well, it's not an avoidance behavior. You're training a dog to, because, um, well, that's just a terminology. We want to be careful. So what we want to do is you can do a couple of things. You can train, you can swim your dog, number one. But if you don't want the dog to swim out to you, and it is very dangerous. Their claws, they scratch people up. Train the dog to do a downstay and not go in the pool. So all you're doing is training your dog a good downstay. That's, I wouldn't consider it an avoidance behavior. But, yeah, we can call it that if you want to. Yes. Um. Johnny says, thanks, Jeff. Looking to get into training after stopping my dogs from major aggression because of your videos. Just can't get out to Rhode Island. Got it. Awesome. <coughs> now you can do it yourself, buddy. Next. Can you give me some water? Yep. Chantel says, um, hey, Jeff, thanks for the videos from Quebec, Canada. Love you. Awesome. I'll be up in Canada um, this weekend. Okay. Collingwood next. <clears throat> Uh, you just read Chantel. Um, Lion's Roar. He barely eats his own food unless it is mixed with wet food. Should I still attempt food training? Lion's Roar, stop mixing it with wet food. Stop mixing it with wet food. Wait the dog out. Seriously, wait the dog out. So you need a dog with a little bit more drive, with a little bit more food drive. You're going to have to wait the dog out. So, But if you're doing a service dog, you want to have a service dog that's willing to work for food. That's going to be your best option to get that dog to get that dog started. So, but you don't have to do food training. You don't have to do food training. Just do remote collar training. If we, we usually add food with it, you can use you can use more compulsion if you want to. Um, but don't your dog is feed your dog twice a day. Feed your dog well. If you're you're not going to feed your dog out of a bowl anymore. So stop adding wet food. If it doesn't want to take food, then don't. Still do some training, and then it doesn't eat that day. You're not withholding food. Don't withhold it. It's there. It's in my hand. It's right there. It's a good quality kibble. If you're doing kibble, it's a good quality kibble. It's nutritious. It's healthy. If you don't want it, that's fine. Eventually, the dog will take it. Next. Dogs can go days longer than that without food. Next. Jamal says, too kind, dude. Appreciate it. All right. You're welcome. Um, Horse Crazy 92. My dog is on a low amount of dog food for weight loss and we were feeding him breakfast in the kitchen and dinner in my room and he would sometimes go in the kitchen and eat the other dog's food so now i am trying to feed him just in my bedroom would you suggest to use a crate and how long do you let him have the food bowl? yeah feed your dog feed your dog in a crate feed him in the same place and dogs take five minutes or less to eat food next and if they don't they're not hungry um jesse says oh there's a bunch of questions coming in hold on let me scroll down a little uh, hi, Jeff and Linda. Just wanted to say thanks again for what you do. I was asked the other day if I run a dog training business because of how my dogs behave. I couldn't believe it. Thank you. Jesse, awesome. Proud of you. <clears throat> uh, this one's from Janet. Hearing trainers saying treat training is bad and I don't want my dog to be dependent on treats. I feed raw food. Should I train without treats? If I train with treats, how do I get them off treats? So this is the thing, Janet. So, so you know, we used to not train with food either. So we don't use treats though. We use the dog's daily food. If you feed raw, they make raw dehydrated food, or you can do raw for that. You can use some raw dehydrated like treats if you want to, or dehydrated vegetables or something like that. How do you get them off food? You start doing variable rewards with it, and then you just eliminate it. So if a trainer says you're always depending on food, that's because they don't know how to get the dog off food. It's easy to get the dog on food. And then if it doesn't listen for food, you do a correction. So if a dog knows, if a dog knows how to do a downstay, if you've done a downstay 250 times and the dog refuses to do it, you punish it. And you have to learn how to properly punish. And a punishment is not abuse. It's no yelling, it's no screaming, but it's for lack of compliance. That's that that's we don't talk science, but that is the science of dog training. It's reward and punishment. And when 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 I when when you when it's a known command. And you refuse to do it, there has to be a consequence. That's how dogs get proofed. That's how dogs get proofed in the real world. Next. Um, 321, the COD. Jeff, we love your philosophy of dog training. Been watching you for the past six months. You totally prepared us for our pug. How do I make him bark on command? Um, I don't teach bark on command, <laughs> but it's um it's done with a toy. It's done with a tug. Next. Or a clicker. 
clicker and food, and you can just get a video how to teach speak. It's called just do speak. Someone, somebody's got, there's a lot of videos out there about teaching speak. Next. This one's from Ernie. Obedience at heel is very good. Trying to get distance down command. Dog returns. You missed a bunch. You missed stands. Didn't I was at the mall one day oh. walking my dog. This guy asked me, can I pet your dog? I told him, no, thank you for asking. The guy insisted on petting my Doberman. What an idiot. Yeah, that's what mm -hmm. people, people are rude. People are rude. But don't ever, don't ever, yeah. That's, and if you would have pet your Doberman, you'd have, to, you'd have to push him away. Next. Okay. Now, Ernie. Obedience at heel is very good. Trying to get distance down. Command dog returns. Yeah, to, to heel, heel then, then downs. Down. How to teach distance obedience. You put, him on, you. you put him on a tie back or you use a place bed. So you put the dog in a sit on a place bed or a place mat, and you start moving away two feet, three feet, four feet, 10 feet, 20 feet, 30 feet. You get what I'm saying? Start moving it back. And the dog gets to good, it goes from a sit to a down on the place bed. You can also use a tie back where the leash is tied to something and you do the exact same thing. Next. It's 936. Oh, we've been on for an hour and six minutes. One more question. Lion's roar. Thank you. I'll try it out. Sorry for so many questions, but do you have tips on elevator stairs and great training? He is terrified of all of them and won't even get near the drain grates. Do, yeah. So anytime you've got a fearful dog, you work them through it. So what I've done, what I do is if a dog's afraid of a, of, of a grate, I walk them over it, walk them in a tight heel. Let's go. Boom. We got grates all over Providence. We have Fire escapes all over the east side of Providence. We have the metal fire escapes where you can see through. I go up and down the fire escapes. What do we do? Let's go. They do it. They all do it. They freak out at the beginning. All right. Wait, hold on. What does Michael say? He's trying to ask a question, but it comes up red. Red text, but it's letting me ask this. That's odd. I don't know why, Michael. Mm. I don't know why. If you would have been rude, we would have banned you. But I don't know why it's coming up red. I don't know what that means. Will I be back in Ontario next year? Um, most likely, yeah. It's the first time I've done it at this location. All right, guys. It has been an hour and seven minutes. We're done with the show. It's Jeff Gelman of Solid Canine Training. I am madly in love with all of you. Um, you can go to rvdogtrainer.com to see my seminar schedule, Solid Canine Training to see my website and meet my staff and see what we do. You can go to patreon.com slash Solid Canine Training, and you can do that. There's a little money down thing here. You can quick make a quick um, uh, thank you donation if you want to right now. Feel free to throw us a couple of dollars. Um, Patreon is good because you get really, like a lot of the questions that people asked here. Oh, see that? He is typing too much if it's over 200 characters. Oh, if it's over 200 characters. Thank you, whoever said, whoever did that. I don't know. Horse crazy. Nine Horse crazy. That, good. I just read the damn questions. All right. Um, if it's under 200 quick characters, then it's too long of a question to ask on my show. So probably join Patreon. On Patreon, on Mondays, I put you can ask actually a over 200 character question, and um, and then I turn it into a, 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 a weekly podcast. So I answer every question. Geez, I, I, every one of my podcast, I get about a dozen to 15 questions. I spend about three to four minutes answering a question, every question. Um, on my Patreon page. And then also people could do Skypes with me. They can do a one-on-one -on -one 15 minute or a one-on-one -on -one, um, 30 minute Skype with me. Because a lot of folks need a lot of help where a, a our, 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 our weekly Q&A show, obviously we get uh, so many questions and it's it's hard to get involved with a lot of them because there's so many people that want, that want help. But I want to just thank everybody so much for being here. And um, I just truly, truly appreciate it. Next week, it won't be too later in the week because I'll still be up in Canada on Monday. Love all of you. Take care.